A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 16, Part 5. Social Change in the Great Depression. With the end of Prohibition, the saloon business mushroomed, one of the few growing areas of enterprise in the 1930s. Another growing industry, which served somewhat the same purpose with less destructive physical effects, was motion pictures. Although several studios met with hard times during the Depression, movies became more popular than ever, providing a low-cost way for people to escape reality temporarily. Some 60 to 90 million Americans went to the movies every week, seeing classic stars such as Greta Garbo, Jean Harlow, Clark Gable, Cary Grant, and Joan Crawford, as well as a relatively new use of the silver screen for full-length animated features, pioneered by Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, 1937. Walt Disney Studios, MGM, Warner Brothers, and many others cranked out formula pictures from the famous studio system in which a motion picture company signed artists and directors to long-term contracts, making them in some cases little more than assembly line employees. The assembly line process of making movies led to great names in the industry being shuffled in and out of pictures like the interchangeable bolts and screws, in Eli Whitney's factory. For all its detractors, the studio system attained, at least briefly, a level of quality that has never been matched. Consider the stunning releases of 1939, by far the best year in motion picture history, with no other coming close. Several notable pictures received Academy Award nominations, including Dark Victory, Of Mice and Men, and Wuthering Heights, at least five of the nominees rank among the greatest films ever to grace the silver screen. The Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Goodbye Mr. Chips, and of course, the picture that swept the Academy Awards, Gone with the Wind. That year, John Wayne, Judy Garland, Jimmy Stewart, and Clark Gable all appeared in roles that defined their careers. Even B-list movies from that year, such as Bo Jest, are considered classics. Radio broadcasting also reached new heights with more than 39 million households owning radios by the end of the 1930s. They heard stars like comedians Jack Benny and Edgar Bergen, or listened to adventure shows such as The Lone Ranger. Perhaps the event that best demonstrated radio's tremendous influence was Orson Welles' broadcast of The War of the Worlds, on October 30th, 1938, on the Mercury Theater on the air. The broadcast induced mass panic as well as convinced thousands of Americans that Martians had landed and had laid waste to major cities in an interplanetary war. The popularity of radio and movies said much about the desire of Americans to escape from the circumstances of the Depression and also from the relentless criticism of American life that emanated from intellectual circles. Such attacks on American institutions commonly appeared in many of the books deemed classics today, but which inspired few at the time. Chief among the critical writers of the day, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, 1939, and Tortilla Flat, 1935, and John Dos Passos, Adventures of a Young Man, 1939, won literary acclaim but the general public passed their books on the way to purchase Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, 1936. Americans showed that they needed chicken soup for the soul, stories of courage, hope, and optimism, not another application of leeches or a dose of castor oil masquerading as social commentary. The First Referendum after four years of the New Deal, many of the programs seemingly had shown positive short-term results. Unemployment had dropped from 12 million to about 8 million. The banking system had been saved, and the panic mentality associated with the stock market crash had ebbed. Most important, Roosevelt's flurry of activity convinced average Americans that he cared about their circumstances and that the administration 
was at least trying to solve the nation's economic woes. On the other hand, most of the long-term dangers and structural damage done by the New Deal programs remained hidden. Even businesses still hesitated to attack Roosevelt's statism, which provided a chance for those companies still operating to solidify their hold on the market, free of new competitors. Thus, Roosevelt stood little chance of being unseated by any candidate in 1936. The Republicans ran Alf Landon, governor of Kansas, who all but endorsed Roosevelt with a Me Too Only Better attitude as a sacrificial candidate. Landon was trounced, receiving only the electoral votes of Maine and Vermont. The Democratic Party completed its remarkable comeback from the depths of Reconstruction by forging a new coalition. Despite the hardships caused by the New Deal's agricultural programs, farmers, especially in the South and West, still remain loyal to the party. Unionized labor's votes were cemented through the minimum wage legislation and the Wagner Act, whereas ethnic groups such as Italian Catholics and Jews were enticed by large numbers of political appointments and repelled by memories of the Republicans' prohibition policies. But the newest group to complete the coalition was comprised of blacks who had supported the GOP since Reconstruction. The shift of the black vote provided the Democratic Party with its single most loyal constituency well after the millennium. Eleanor Roosevelt, in particular, publicly courted black voters for her husband, and public education programs temporarily provided a stimulus for reducing black illiteracy. New Deal public health programs also proved popular, and Roosevelt's rhetoric, if not his actions, was supportive and sympathetic to black concerns. Republicans, who had essentially abandoned blacks after 1877 and refused to challenge Plessy, lost their appeal to black citizens who still labored under the strict segregation in parts of the country and blatant racial discrimination virtually everywhere. A combination of blacks, unions, ethnic groups, and big city intellectual elites ensured democratic dominance over both houses of Congress for more than 40 years, ensuring a total grip on public policy agendas, even when Republican presidents were in office. FDR also wielded massive patronage powers through the New Deal programs. In the 1934 midterm elections, Democrat advisors identified 60 key congressional districts where a sudden infusion of New Deal jobs could turn the tide in their favor. Federal money poured into six West Virginia districts, while Maine got over $100 million for public works jobs employing 44,000 people. Pennsylvania, which had received just under $13 million in four years of the Hoover administration, was swamped with $678 million. Purely put, Roosevelt bought entire sections of the country with government programs. Roosevelt's second hundred days promised to exceed the ambitions of the first term, building on the huge congressional majorities with his re-election landslide. The president proposed a new set of radical taxes and redistributionist measures aimed at ending inheritance, penalizing successful corporations, and beginning a steady attack on top-bracket individual fortunes. It is worth reiterating, however, that New Deal policies were only aimed in part at restoring the American economy, just as Reconstruction policies were only directed in part at helping the freedmen. One important objective always lurked just below the smooth waters of Roosevelt's rhetoric, and that was the ability of his policies to maintain the Democratic Party in power for the next several generations. Virtually every one of the New Deal programs in some way made people more dependent on government, not more independent or self-sufficient. And when the government was run by Democrats, the logical conclusion voters had to draw was that whatever they got from government came from the Democrats. Social Security, farm subsidies, special favors for labor, 
They all targeted separate groups that played on their specific fears, and all problems were solved only through the efforts of Democratic politicians in Washington. Merely to raise the question of whether such policies were wise invited attack at election time, usually in the form of a question to the usually Republican opponent. Why do you want to fill in the blank with take food away from the elderly, keep farmers poor, and so on? Roosevelt had created a sea change, therefore, not only in dealing with a national economic crisis, but also by establishing an entire new political culture of democratic dominance for decades to come. The New Deal Stalls Just as it appeared that the New Deal might enter a higher orbit in the universe of policymaking, several events brought the Roosevelt administration down to earth. First, the Supreme Court, with a string of rulings, found that many components of the New Deal, including the NRA, the AAA, and a number of smaller New Deal acts, or state variants of New Deal laws, were unconstitutional. Seeing the Supreme Court as standing athwart the tide of progressive history, FDR found an obscure president in the British system that, he thought, allowed him to diminish the relative vote of the four hardcore conservatives on the Supreme Court by simply adding more members, the judicial equivalent of watering down soup. Roosevelt justified his bold attempt by arguing that the justices were overworked, proposing that for every justice of at least 10 years' experience over the age of 70, the president should be allowed to appoint a new one. Here, FDR not only alienated many of his congressional supporters who were themselves in their 60s and 70s, but also positioned himself against the checks and balance system of the federal government. His actions impressed Italian fascist Benito Mussolini, who observed, America has a dictator in FDR. There are no longer intermediaries between him and the nation, noted the Italian dictator. The issue threatened to erode much of Roosevelt's support in Congress until abruptly the Supreme Court issued several decisions favorable to the New Deal, and at the same time, one of the conservative justices announced his retirement. A more pliable court, in the eyes of the New Dealers, killed the court reform bill before it caused Roosevelt further damage. Over the next three years, Roosevelt appointed five of his own men, all Democrats, to the Supreme Court, making it a true Roosevelt court and further molding Washington into a one-party town. Roosevelt was preparing to launch another round of legislation when a second development hammered the administration on the economic front. In 1937, the nation had finally squeaked past the output levels attained before the crash, marking seven years' worth of complete stagnation. Then suddenly, the business index plummeted, dropping below the 1935 levels. Steel production dropped from 80% of capacity to below 20% and government deficits shot up despite all-time high levels of taxation. Some in the brain trust rightly perceived that business had been terrorized, but the timing wasn't right. No particular act had just been implemented. What had so frightened industry? The answer was that the cumulative effects of the minimum wage law, the Wagner Act, higher taxation, and Keynesian inflationist policies all combined with what now appeared to be unchecked power in FDR's hands. Hearing a new explosion of heated anti-monopolistic rhetoric by Roosevelt's advisors, business began to question how long it could absorb further punishment. Although in the early 1930s, American business had supported some of the relief programs to keep from being the scapegoats of the Depression, by late in the decade, the business community feared that even the most radical social and political reorganization was not beyond consideration by the New Dealers. Assistant Attorney General Robert Jackson singled out by name leading industrialists and criticized their salaries. Harold Ickes charged that 60 families sought to establish control over the nation and that the struggle must be fought through to a finish. 
Roosevelt's New Dealers had taken Reconstruction-era sectional antagonisms, repackaged them as class envy, and offered them up on an apocalyptic scale that was the Great Depression equivalent of waving the bloody shirt, or perhaps more fittingly, waving the unemployment compensation check. The New Dealers' comments made business more skittish than it already was and precipitated the Roosevelt Recession. Between October 1937 and May 1938, WPA relief rolls in the auto towns in the Midwest swelled, increasing 194% in Toledo and 434% in Detroit. St. Louis, Cleveland, Omaha, and Chicago all eliminated or drastically curtailed welfare and unemployment payouts. Nationally, unemployment rose from near 12% back to 19%. The ranks of organizations like the National Association of Manufacturers, which opposed the New Deal, started to swell. Roosevelt nevertheless remarked, We are on our way back. We planned it that way. What Roosevelt did not understand was that although many people accepted some New Deal programs as necessary, they saw them only as temporary expedients. Meanwhile, the New Dealers were never able to develop an adequate reform ideology to challenge the business rhetoricians. A third shift against the New Deal came at the ballot box. The public grew concerned enough about the unchecked power of the Democrats that in the 1938 midterm elections, the Republicans picked up 81 seats in the House, eight in the Senate, and 13 governorships. It was a stinging rebuke to New Deal excesses and was achieved despite the fact that the Democrats had started to call in their patronage markers. This meshing of politics and jobs during the 1938 congressional elections raised another unsettling aspect of the New Deal. Allegations that WPA funds had been used in a Kentucky campaign prompted a Senate investigation which raised questions about the potential abuse of federal offices for electioneering. As a consequence, the Hatch Act, prohibiting political activity by federal officials or campaign activities on federal property, and named for Senator Carl Hatch of New Mexico, was passed in 1939. Fourth, Roosevelt had caused more than a little concern when he introduced a benign appearing reorganization bill in Congress. At first, it appeared to be a routine reshuffling of bureaucratic agencies. But by the time Congress, which was now more Republican, debated the bill in 1938, the court packing scheme was fresh in the legislators' minds, as was the fascist takeover of the Weimar Republic in Germany. No one thought FDR was Hitler, but papers were increasingly using the term dictator when they referred to the president. Congress decided that Roosevelt had started to infringe on constitutional separation of powers. Shocking the president, 108 Democrats crossed the aisle to defeat the reorganization bill in the House, prodded by thousands of telegrams from home. Reaction to Roosevelt's power grab revealed how deeply entrenched values regarding private property, opportunity, and upward mobility still were. Despite six years of controlling the American economy, of dominating the political appointment process, of rigging the system with government bribes to special interest groups, and of generally favorable press, the public still resisted attempts to socialize the industrial system or to hand the president more power. It was a healthy sign, one not seen across the oceans where dark forces snuffed out the light of freedom. And we'll read Demons Unleashed in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.